So, Lena, thank you for joining me. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. So, we're putting out a whole series of films this week on what Jordan Peterson's relationship to the left and Jordan Peterson's relationship to, I mean, the left is a quite broad term. Um, and for me, it also covers most people on the sort of more progressive end of the spectrum. Um, I know that you've got a real interest in the developmental society, a lot of sort of shared interests on how we move towards a sort of more integration of, of left and right. So I'm not sort of just pegging you as someone on the left, but um, you're, you, would you agree that you're more on the progressive end of society? No, I, I think I'm, I'm uh, in the middle and I try to make my spectrum as broad and, and wide and deep and uh, with as many aspirations as, as possible. And I see a deep value in all the democratic fractions that, that we have had. So, so I really try to see the full spectrum and I, and I think that is, that is the future. What do you personally find valuable in Jordan Peterson? I find it very valuable that he has given a more complex understanding of the conservative and the liberal, even though I think his liberal version uh, should be divided, I mean, should be more nuanced. Um, and he has brought a lot of academic knowledge and history and theology and psychology uh, into the public sphere and into our conversation in society. And it has been almost impossible to bring these topics into the broader debate, the broader conversation. So, I mean, that's really great. I, I just love it because it means that we can talk about some things now for which we did not share a uh, vocabulary before. And, and that is really important. And I also think, and that is why I illustrated it like this, is that, I mean, if you up here have absolute control uh, and down here have absolute chaos, order and chaos, These, this is the axis that, that Jordan B. Peterson is talking about. Um, I mean, libertarianism, without an acceptance of all the other ideologies and of society, will turn the world into chaos. On the other hand, if uh, the conservatives or the socialists gain absolute control and order, it will be totalitarianism. And so I, I think that that axis between order and chaos is really uh, is really a good tool, and and that has inspired me a lot. Hmm. I was going to ask how your perspective has it changed your perspective on the world in any way? No, uh, and one of the reasons is that many of the things that he I, I have a background in economy and theology. I never completed my theology studies, so I know most of the mythologies that he talked that he talks about. So, so they're not new to me. I, I see them perhaps in a slightly uh, different light. Uh, I also see some things that he, that he uh, is completely missing, um, particularly when it comes to this whole thing about the patriarchy and uh, the order and chaos and women being <laughs> the force of chaos and men the, order, the, the, the force of order. I, I think both sexes both genders contribute with order and chaos um but i don't i don't think he'd say men, i don't think he'd define it as men and women being order and chaos he'd say the the masculine right the masculine and feminine order right. and the feminine principle is right. undifferentiated in some way right right which i think does map on to to taoism and, and buddhism sure but when you well. but, when, but when you see his, his illustrations i mean the there's the the father standing for order and the hero the son being the creative, uh, I think he calls it the creative hero, who is the one who can transform the existing society into the next uh, order of things, the, the next kind of society, um, a, a more complex society. Uh, they are men, and, and the force of chaos is portrayed as, as the big mother. So, I mean, she's usually a woman, so, so there is, but yes, the masculine and the feminine. But if you look at the, and, and this is where I think he has this, this really big blind spot, which is that all the history that he is describing and interpreting and bringing into order um, is just the written history. So it's the history and the mythologies of the Bronze Age, Iron Age, and modernity. You can say medieval times and the Renaissance, but, but it's, it's the written history. And what's interesting about the written history 
from the dawn of picture writing and uh, particularly the alphabet is that this coincides with bronze and iron. It coincides with the axial age, uh, the big trade route be be between China and, and uh, Greece and Italy. So that axis, geographical axis in the same climate zone and the first really big empires. But before that, uh, there was Stone Age agriculture, which had a mother goddess. And there was probably, I don't know, 15,000 years of Stone Age agriculture. Maybe it's just 10 experts are debating right now. Um, and before that, there was Hunter Gather Stone Age. So John B. Peterson completely misses the animism of the Hunter Gatherers and the Mother Earth uh, goddess of the early farmers. Um, at least as far as I have come in his maps of meaning, I, I'm still, I still have like 60 pages left. There may be a stuff that he, <laughs> that he hasn't uh, talked about yet, but I doubt it. So um, what the, the mythology is that here analyzing and referring to are from the Bronze Age and Iron Age, which is also the age of the patriarchy. Because when you live in a hunter-gatherer group of maybe maximum 200 people, it's rather egalitarian. You don't have to keep order by using violence. If you live in a village of Stone Age uh, agriculture, maybe it's a thousand people. So you have to use a bit of violence to keep the unruly, particularly young men, uh, calm and make them behave. But you don't have to build a hierarchy. And so that is also the time span of the Mother Earth goddess and where the early farmers, they were really, I mean, they, the, how the, you know, the, the, the plants come up from the ground and that's the Mother Earth giving birth. So she was the organizing principle. But then when you get into the Bronze Age and Iron Age and you have some of these cities 3,000 years ago with, I don't know, 100,000 people, at least 10,000 people, you get a different, very different kind of power. Uh, and that is also where uh, male chauvinism begins. You can read it from the texts. So, so the epistemology, the frame of reference within which Jordan B. Peterson is working is only part of our history. And it's a part of our history where yes, the men struggled to create order in these big societies. And the way that they could do it was through religion, through narrative, through force, through violence, and the women became part of their property. And so you also had the men going out uh, to wars, you had them traveling for trade. So you had men who traveled from city to city uh, or from village to village. And when you travel, you have to be able to say, I'm so-and-so coming from this place, who are you? And you can negotiate. And that creates a consciousness and awareness that you don't get if you are just stuck in the home with the children and all the chicken and all the goats and you have, I mean, you're not allowed to go out on your own because you're a woman, there's a risk of rape and there's a risk of abduction. I mean, there are all kinds of risks to women in these societies. Um, and so who ended up writing the mythologies? Well, the men. Once you can see beyond that and see what came before that, you get a much richer perspective on, on who we are as, as a civilization. I mean, it's a complex thing, but, but he does defend Western culture, he does defend the, the hierarchies of competence. So in a, in a way, he does defend the system that some people are calling a patriarchy. Um, right. My, my and sense and where I kind of align with what you're saying as well is that I do think that he, that it, it's altogether possible that what we're experiencing now is a shift from a sort of male, uh, way of looking at the world to a way of looking at the world that incorporates the feminine and I think his his main focus is on reviving the reviving the masculine power of the culture and and actually I think that's necessary but it's potentially not sufficient and what we actually need is a is a reinvigoration of the divine masculine if you want to see that but also for it to be matched with the divine feminine we've created a society where physical strength is no longer the defining thing we would hope so potentially the, uh, the the potential for genuine equality and genuine 
both both men and women connecting with their more sort of intuitive, direct ways of knowing, it, there's a potential for that, it would seem. So yeah, I, I think that within within the within the known structures and epistemology of Western tradition, Jordan B. Peterson is doing a really good job. And the irony is that in Maps of Meaning, he says that if you insist on staying, remaining with the old understanding of the world as the world changes, then you are evil. <laughs> and what I don't see Jordan B. Peterson doing is taking that step outside the known epistemology, becoming a creative hero, struggling with the uh, big, big, horrible, chaotic mother, and then coming back and sharing with us what the next epistemology should look like. What is the next mythology? What is the next organization of society? And exactly, how do we get both the male and the female integrated into a meaningful culture, a meaningful civilization? And we do have an enormous young man problem because everything that young men were, I mean, everything that evolution made out of young men uh, that which is, let me say, that which is unique to young men are things that we don't really need anymore. We don't allow anybody to have any dangerous endeavors anymore. And, and in some respect, thank God for that, because it's a much more civilized, peaceful society. But it also means that there's this face uh, where, where young men are suffering. And I think that Jordan B. Peterson is addressing that, and it's, it's a very, very important group that we are not helping in our society at the moment. There's, there's a lot of debate, um, especially in progressive circles, as to whether Jordan Peterson is a positive or a negative net influence. And a lot of people come down on the side that he's a negative influence. What's your view? Oh, no way. No, I, I totally disagree there. I think he's a very positive influence because he's voicing something that we have not been able to voice in a very long time and that is important and it must we must have that as part of who we are. Um, and he gives it, uh, he gives it a, a very well founded and well researched voice. I mean, the, the postmodernism is a transition phase. You cannot build societies on postmodernism. Why can't you build a, a society on postmodernism? Well, because postmodernism is about deconstruction and you cannot build structures on deconstruction. So, uh, there are really important insights from postmodernism because there's a deconstruction and there's uh, relativizing everything and, and the ability to switch perspectives and see, seeing your own culture with the perspective of somebody else. We just need to combine that with all the other phases that we've been going through. We need to combine this postmodernism with, with modernity. We need the signs of modernity. And, and as Peterson has pointed out, which is, is really, really crucial, we need the narratives and the stories and the ethical, moral struggles, existential struggles of pre-modernity, of this whole uh, phase of uh, written history, because they were people just like us. So there's a poetic world and a symbolic world that touches us in a different way and has things to say that science cannot say because it is not what science does. What can guide us is wisdom and human experience and moral values. And, and bringing that back into the public debate is a, is, is a really big contribution. And then before the pre-modern or traditional um, written history, Iron and Bronze Age society, there was all the Stone Age indigenous culture, which has a spirituality and a sense of uh, intimate connectedness that you can only have in, if you're in small groups. And then we have modernity and science that both are really, really crucial if we are to have democracy, um, functioning states, electricity. We've uh, had a bit of a technical problem with the connection here. I mean, we wouldn't even have had a connection if it hadn't been for, for modern science. So, so there are all these things that are equally important, but in each their time, each, each their place.